my name is Mick Cooper and uh, I'm going to be talking through a video of person centered counselling practice. So I guess what I'm doing in this video is that I'm uh, as a person centered practitioner really trying to give the client space to talk through what's going on uh, and make sense of their problems and understand and think about ways forward in, in, in the way that works for them. Um, but also as a person centered practitioner, I do have a kind of experiential um, focus. What I mean by that is I'm also trying to understand the client's kind of deeper experiencing and help them connect with their experiencing at a, at a deeper level. Um, because there's a sense in which that's where some of the answers for them are going to come. That if they're talking about things in maybe a kind of um, just on the surface, um, the, it's uh, more rehearsed material, things that they're more familiar with. Um, then they might be less likely to move forward, as the research would suggest, than if they're talking about things uh, more deeply, more emotionally connecting, with, maybe with more their emotions, so they can really understand what's going on for them. So let me start the video. Um, here we go. Hi, Martha. Hi. Nice to see you. You so, too. So, do you have a sense of uh, what would be useful to talk about? How, how are things going? Um, That's a pretty awful start. How are things going? Um, I can do a lot better than that. But I think probably just a bit anxious. Um, I do often say at the beginning of sessions, though, to clients, like, um, how would you like to use this time? I think it can be sometimes useful to help focus clients and help them think about how they want to, um, how they want to work for that session. Um, yeah, I mean, things are okay. Um, this work is just insane yeah. right now. Um, like, as you know, like I like my work. I like for the most part, the people I work with. Um, but yesterday, this one, this one guy, Dave, he, he's like my assistant, but he can't any, man. um, I give him tasks and he always seems to just like say he's trying to do it and ends up being blamed on me or other people just don't know that like that task was assigned to him. Um, and so then it looks like I'm not doing my, my work. Um, so that just like makes me so aware of what it's like to work with good people, but obviously I can't say anything like to my boss. Um, cause I don't know. I just can't put that that kind of authority. Yeah, you um, you were saying about Dave. I remember you saying last week about Dave and saying you were getting really yeah. frustrated with him. Yeah, he like, I don't even know if he's aware that he's not doing things. Um, but I don't know. He's nice. People respect him. But I don't know if if like you're my assistant. It seems like get things done. Um. What 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 happened? Did something happen then yesterday that really? Yeah, of... yeah. So you can see there that I'm asking for detail. I guess I'm inviting the client to talk about it a bit more specifically. Often I find one of uh, the best ways into more of that experiencing the the more emotional side of things is to ask for details and to try and understand what actually happened. Sometimes clients can talk quite generally, um, <clears throat> quite vaguely about things. And it can be useful to say, right, okay, what actually happened here? Let's go through it. Let's try and get some sense of what you were feeling in relation to Dave or, or what was going on for you. Yeah. So we have this big project um, and like each person has their own tasks. And because he's my assistant, like I gave him a bunch of tasks to do um, and I was relying on him. And I mean, so were other people. And he just left work early. Uh like he was like oh no I have plans and he tried saying that he told us about it um which like I don't think he did um and so it just left all of us with way more to do and other people I don't know they were like yeah no that's totally fine we'll get it done but to me that's just not you can't just do that it left all of a sudden all of his tasks I either now had to do or give to other people um and like things were due today. So I don't know. He's uh, just like a pain to work with. Uh, it's not the first time either. 
Yeah, you were saying. What were you, so what were you the feeling yesterday? What was the kind of emotion? What was the feeling for you? And again, you can hear there that I'm trying to get down and understand more the feeling. I guess what I'm doing often when I'm counselling is like trying to have a bodily felt sense of what goes on for the client, particularly with emotions. Um, we can understand it cognitively, but I'm always trying to get that embodied sense of like, how does it feel? What was going on? And, and I'm, I'm not at this point really understanding that. The client's talking about this problem with Dave, but um, yeah, I want to I wanna know it so I can reflect it back and kind of go deeper into it. I guess I'm also what I'm aware of is that with this client, she, she came to therapy, so she's been feeling low. Um, and she's been having relationships with the boyfriend. So I'm just kind of clocking in the back of my mind that, you know, she's talking about work and work issues, but that wasn't necessarily what she came to talk about. So there's kind of question about whether we carry on talking about this, which is client seems to have some energy about it, or whether perhaps she would find it more helpful to go back and to be thinking about what's happening with her boyfriend, Dave. So that's just in the back of my mind. I don't know. He's just like pissing me off but but also other people were totally fine with it um so you you were feeling pissed off yeah maybe he's just like i don't know he's new to the company um so i don't know if that like is something that he'll end up i don't know it sounds like it sounds like for you martha there was a feeling of kind of like being pissed off with him you're frustrated with him, you're angry with him, but also you're kind of noticing that you're feeling those things and that other people aren't feeling that. And uh, I wonder what, that, what what that's like, what that brings up for you. Um. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if other people aren't feeling it or or if they just don't don't show it in the same way. I don't know. Like, obviously, I can't get pissed off with him at work. Um. So... It's mainly just like when he does things like that. I don't know because he's done he's done things like that before, where he just drops his all of his tasks. So you can see that I'm really trying to avoid, in a sense, getting a discuss into a discussion about Dave and whether Dave's doing the right thing or wrong thing. For me, person centered therapy is about really trying to connect with things. I was saying at that experiential level, like what is my client feeling? What's she going through? one of the ways we can kind of move away from that is if we end up getting caught up in discussions about so-and-so and and, and other people and the client here does have quite an externalized focus uh i've asked her a few times you can see about how she feels and she's tending to go back um talk about others which is fine and you know at some point in work you might kind of notice that maybe further down the line but at this point um it feels more helpful to kind of stay with that but try and bring her back into how she's feeling where she at, she's at with it um uh, it's <laughs> annoying. It's annoying. I, don't know. <laughs> I can hear that kind of annoyed pissed off you're kind of smiling but actually you were really annoyed yeah there's a kind of incongruence between how she's expressing herself the smiling and laughing but actually that there was an annoyance and I'm trying to kind of just recognize that discrepancy and invite her back into that annoyance and that, that feeling. Tell me about that. Tell me about that kind of being annoyed. Um, How does it feel for you? I don't know. It's just like, it like makes me want to yell at him or something, which obviously isn't appropriate at the workplace. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Yell. No, like I want, I mean, obviously I can't. You're yell. not going to yell. No. But if you were going to yell, what would you say to him? Um, like grow up. <laughs> like you have responsibilities. Sometimes one way of helping clients to connect with more the feelings is inviting them to speak from that position or to say what they might say to somebody and to kind of express it allows them to sometimes connect a bit more deeply with the emotion. You know, grow up, you have responsibilities. Yeah. I mean, I, I just don't feel like he's aware of, like, his actions. Whatever he drops, all of a sudden now is put on us. Yeah, and that, that feels what unfair. Yeah. It feels unfair. He's just kind of going off and you're left, I mean, to pick everything up. Yeah. 
I'm just noticing actually as you're talking about that, I guess, you know, a couple of weeks ago you were saying you you know, things are feeling difficult with your partner and that that's difficult. And uh I guess there's some of those it sounds like there's there's a few resonances there between what you're feeling with Dave and also what you're feeling with your boyfriend about you, you know, you were saying about kind of grow up, take some responsibility. So what you can see there is that I do bring it back to <clears throat> what she came to therapy to talk about and what she'd been talking about in the session before about her boyfriend and kind of making the link because I'm picking up those things about take responsibility, uh, people just not holding responsibility that seems a parallel. I mean, I guess is that leading uh, in a way it is a, a bit and perhaps I could have said something like, you know, I know you're talking about Dave and I wonder if you'd want to carry on talking about Dave or whether, you know, it'd be more useful to focus on your boyfriend. I could have made that a bit more explicit rather than perhaps leading her in a particular direction. Uh, but I guess I was struck by the connection and thought that might be useful to explore with her. Yeah, I guess. How's, how's things been going there? Uh, and again, it's a pretty crappy question. How's things been going now? Uh, it's very vague and non-specific. It's not particularly helpful. Um, I mean, things are normally good. Um, like, obviously we get along. He's funny. Um, we just hit one year. Um, yeah, I mean, for the most part, I would say things are good. We hang out with friends a lot. You know, this isn't unusual that a client comes and they <clears throat> have a problem that they bring, but then actually when you talk to them about it, they say, yeah, well, it's kind of fine. Um, I guess it's difficult for people often to acknowledge that things are difficult. We don't like to feel sometimes many of us um, more painful emotions. So it's understandable that the client is maybe kind of pushing that side of things away. And I think <clears throat> from a person-centered standpoint, our role can be to just give them space to be able to also invite them into talking about maybe the more difficult thing. I sometimes think that therapy and the real value of it is a place where you can talk about things that may be more difficult to talk about elsewhere. Um, and so this is an opportunity for the client to do that. And sometimes that can be just by providing that acceptance and unconditional positive regard that allows the client to feel that they can talk about anything and they're not being judged. But sometimes questioning invitations can also be perhaps a, a useful part of that. Um... He's nice. Um, but you, but you did say that you know when we were talking a few weeks ago that this, this there's also difficulties and in a sense yeah. of stuff you want to sort out. Yeah, like. So you can hear there that I'm bringing it back to the difficulties and inviting her to talk about. I guess the stuff that she has said that is concerning her. I don't know. I feel like. I mean, as I said, that he, like, disappears sometimes just for a few days and, like, doesn't text or anything. Um, I mean, like, he's reassuring about it or whatever, but, like, that also feels childish. Um, In what sense? Like, you can't, you can't just disappear or, like, not message, ghost me or whatever. Um... I don't know if he's like in contact with other people when he does that, but whenever I tell him, he's just like, oh no, I was okay. Um, kind of like laughs it off. Um, what, what did you say? You're not sure if he's in contact with other people. When she said that, I was wondering, did she mean that he's got other girlfriends perhaps? So that's something that I, um, yeah, I was quite surprised by and, and, and wanting to ask, I guess. Is that about me being curious? I don't think so. It's about trying to understand the, the, the full picture. Well, like, you know, when he, like, doesn't message me back, I don't think other people are like, oh, my God, he's not messaging me either. It feels like it's only me that he's not texting. Um, like, he's close with his family, so I'm sure they're in, they're in touch, but... So I'm wrong from that. And uh, yeah, so she kind of corrects my understanding, which is fine. So I, I go with what she's describing. I don't know. That just feels like, yeah, like he's ghosting me, but it's just like so much of his flakiness or like his lack of awareness. Um, 
I don't know. I feel like all guys are just like so many years behind <laughs> in my hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's something I could have picked up on. And I could have said, you know, <laughs> noticing that you're talking about you guys being years behind. Um, and you're saying that to male counsel and wonder how that feels. Um, I think something I've learned is that sometimes they can be a real value and bring it into the room. But sometimes it's not really what the client is focused on. And I think that would have felt a bit of a kind of diversion from uh where where the client is at and saying you know how does it feel to say that to me as a male counselor i wasn't massively uh impacted upon by it i think if i maybe been more impacted i might have been more likely to uh bring it up and again it's quite abstract it's quite general and i guess i'm trying to help the client to talk about things in a more um concrete uh affective way in maturity and it's but like he also, but you can see I'm not laughing at that point. He also, I mean, what's there to complain about? Like he's, he treats me well. He's generous. He's funny. I don't know. Yeah, but you were gonna say it's, it's how how does it feel? Because, you know, I guess on the one hand you're saying it's fine, it's okay, it's going well, but that that you, there's some serious concerns there that you have. Yeah. So again. Working in a person-centered way, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing her back to the things that she said that she's concerned with. Um, I'm inviting her to talk about the things that feel a bit deeper, uh, I guess. Um, you know, I guess from some person-centered standpoint, classical, you might say that's quite leading. Um, but I think experientially, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of legitimacy, justification. And trying to help the client deeper into maybe the more difficult things. I mean, like the concerns, I don't know if that's just like on me. Um, he's like, he's great. And then some small things will happen, you know, like disappearing or um, I think, I don't know if we, no, I don't think we talked about this last time, but like we had a, wedding a friend of mine was getting married um I'm like obviously he was going to be my plus one um and then just a couple of days before he was like sorry can't come um and said that like there was an emergency with his mom which I don't know maybe they're close but not a big enough emergency like I saw him a few days after the wedding um and he didn't mention it so that was just like flakiness at the highest level um I don't know it's like that just feels childish also um but Sorry, then of what, course what he was childish? apologetic um just like childish to to do that kind of like flakiness or dropping things at the last minute or like not being aware that your actions have consequences. Um, I mean, but I guess like he apologized and stuff. So like that's not childish, but. That's, that's probably not helpful. I mean, that's an example of me asking about someone else in her world um, rather than maybe what she means by childish. Again, what I'm trying to do though is get that kind of felt sense of what's going on for that. And I'm kind of, yeah, I mean, what do you think? Um, disappointment, maybe sadness, um, kind of anger, maybe. I think probably at this point, I'm just beginning to get a sense of some of the disappointment that is there behind what she's saying. But it's kind of left you with a sense. I mean, it sounds like the apology felt okay, but it's also left you with a sense of, I don't know, what is it? Uncertainty or a feeling of that you can't trust him? So you can see I'm taking that back to the client and saying, you know, this is what I'm kind of picking up. Is, is that right? That's that kind of empathic unfolding process of trying to kind of attune to the client and understand with them what it is that they're experiencing. Um, I mean, like, yeah, his apology. Like, he apologized. That's step one. <laughs> um, I don't know, but like, how many times can you apologize? I don't know. Like he, I, it just didn't make me feel like this was going to be the last apology. Um, 
Oh, like, it's going to be a lot more. Yeah, or like, oh, apologizing then just like gets rid of whatever just happened. Um, or is it like, I'm not going to forget that he just dropped out, you know? Um, but to him, maybe, maybe it's like, oh, well, if I do something and then I apologize for it, like mistake erased, um, which like, that's dumb. That's childish. Hmm. Cause, cause I see for you, it sounds like it, it isn't erased that there's something that's still there. Tell me, tell me what, so what happened? So you were going to go to this cause it sounds like that had quite an impact on you. So you were, you planned to go to this friend's wedding. Yeah. So yeah. take me through it. That's a pretty convoluted uh, response. First, trying to kind of pick up with a client and then going on to ask a question, not very uh, succinct. But I guess what I'm doing in that latter part is inviting her to say a bit more in detail. I'm kind of trying to, you know, and it's not like a cognitive thing about trying to understand the story. I mean, it partly is that, but it's also about wanting to get a more concrete sense of what actually happened so that I can understand more about where she is in her world and in relation to this situation. Yeah, I know. She's a really close friend. Um, we've known each other since we were little. Um, like Josh has met her a bunch. Um, and so she was getting married. Um, and obviously Josh knew for a while that he was going to be my plus one, which was obvious. Um, plus like they got to know each other. Um, and then we like we knew what that we were gonna have to travel and like pay for a hotel and stuff like that um and he wasn't in the party but i was um and just like a couple of days before he he called me but i think i like like i couldn't talk i think i was at work um and so then just over text he was like he was apologetic, but he was like, Hey, sorry, can't come to the wedding. I'm like, that was it. <laughs> and so obviously I was like, you know, we need to talk about this. Um, but he just said that there was an emergency with his mom and then ghosted me for a few days. So that's like, well, like the ghosting is normal for him. Um, but obviously not just like dropping the wedding. Um, and so I had to go, I mean, like, fine, I can go alone. I've, I've done that. <laughs> I know how to be independent. Um, but it just, it sucked. Like I, I was relying on him. Um, and so then I had to go to the, the wedding alone. Um, obviously like my friend Carla was, I don't know. She was, it was her wedding day, but it was like, you know, where's Josh? Um, and I was like, I actually didn't have an answer. I was like, oh, emergency with his mom. Um, and then it was just like a simple apology when I got back. So again, from a person centered standpoint, I guess the question is like, what do you think that she's feeling here? Like what's the core feeling? What's the red thread, the kind of underlying feeling? Is it disappointment? Is it shame? Is it anger? Um, from a person centered standpoint, that those maybe hidden feelings are a kind of an expression of our what Rogers, Carl Rogers talks about as the organismic value and potential. It's like our, our kind of innate sense of knowing a particular situation. And, you know, her disappointment, for instance, is a, is a response to something that is disappointing, that is, doesn't feel good enough. And if we can help her if I as a counsellor can help her uh, recognise that and access that and kind of take it seriously, then that allows her to um, think about it, to draw on it, to think about what she really wants in her life, not necessarily to end the relationship or not, but that rather than pushing those kind of feelings away by allowing herself to recognise those feelings, she can actualise, as Rogers would have talked about, more of her the, her full self, her full perception experiencing the world rather than having certain elements of her experiencing denied distorted because they're they're, they're too maybe painful or, or that she doesn't feel that she's allowed to have those experiences so 
So how did you feel? I mean, just taking winding back a bit. So so you get this text from him saying, "Just sorry, I can't." Call. How did you feel? Um, I mean, like he tried to call, and I was at work. Um, and like you know, so we spoke for a few minutes. Um, no, but like when he texted, I was. I don't know. Like on one hand, it felt familiar. Um, it also totally sucked. Um, I don't know. It kind of just made me feel like alone or like alone, but also, okay, well, like this independence is normal or familiar. So there was a sense of familiarity. Yeah. Can you say, say a bit more about that when you, when you say familiar, what do you mean? Um, like, I don't know. We've only been together a year. So like, you know, I've been single in the past. Um, just like this feeling of I'm on my own, like both in a good way of like, you know, I'm independent. I can do my own things. Um, and like can take care of myself, things like that. But it also just felt, I don't know, like he wasn't, he wasn't aware of how it would make me feel. Like one, all of a sudden to drop a wedding that we had been looking forward to. And then also like to do that over text. So it, it felt like he wasn't he wouldn't have been aware and what was that for you did you feel angry with him or upset or disappointed um, I mean like I was I think I felt angry that he did it without an explanation or like one that felt valid um no but I think I was more just like hurt mm. there's something about kind of going back into a place of just being on your own and having to do things by yourself, which as you say, there's some freedom there and there's some excitement, but there's also something about it for you that feel feels familiar and a bit maybe hurtful to be back there again. Yeah. Uh... You can see that the um, pace of the session has really changed. It's really slowed down. You can see her expression is much more serious. Uh, whereas it, earlier on, she was smiling a lot, and laughing a lot. She's kind of gone into this. She's beginning, I think, to connect a, a, a bit with her feelings of her. And I'm getting that sense as well, although it's interesting what I said there is still kind of going a bit with my sense of it, which was around more around disappointment, uh, which is maybe my my misinterpretation, my stuff, rather than maybe just being with her and that sense of hurt. But we're connecting with it now. And there, there, there is a kind of hurt there in that relationship with Josh. Um, I mean, like the the like independence part, I'm fine with. I think like the hurtful part was like the fact that it didn't seem like he really understood how much this meant to me, um, and that you know, like photos at the wedding and like the experience of going to a wedding, that kind of thing, like all of a sudden, not only will he not be there, but it's like, look at Martha, she's single, even though I'm not, but just like, I don't know. So there was a sense that maybe people would be looking at you in, in the photos and things and saying, oh, there's Martha, she's single. Yeah, like all of a sudden now, like, you know, people know we're dating, so to have to ask like answer questions people are asking or I don't know it was like one added thing um mm. and like something that we were looking forward to to experience together um I keep on picking up what I keep on picking up is a kind of feeling of disappointment of like the, there was something from Josh you were wanting in the relationship or a kind of someone who's there with you someone that you could be seen as part of a couple and that he's kind of dropped that and not really with a clear explanation or understanding of how that how that might feel for you. Yeah. Yeah, no, that sounds right. Um... You know, when a client says that sounds right, um, it's not always right. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I guess I really strongly picked up on the disappointment. I'm not sure if for Martha that was her kind of core feeling there. Like she talked about her. Um, there was also something there very much felt about shame and uh, young people seeing her and it's not Josh not being there and wondering why. So that might have been another route to go down. Um, <clears throat> but I, I hope what you can see there is that the, the kind of acceptance is around. There's no real judgment about what she's feeling however she's feeling is there and, and and it's not that i'm kind of trying hard not to judge it's just it doesn't come into it because i'm just trying to understand what it is that martha is experiencing in that situation to understand some of those deeper feelings so that we can kind of connect with that organismic self sense from her of what she wants and needs i don't know it just feels like like maybe this disappointment is always there um like, especially just with him ghosting and stuff. Um, and then this just felt like 10 times more. Um, like, for a multi-day trip, like, for a wedding. Um, I don't know, but it, it also feels like, like, who am I to be disappointed? Like, he's also really nice. He apologized. Um, I don't know. But yeah, it sucked. Um... It's hard to, it sounds like with that disappointment, part of you maybe feels it or that feeling of being hurt and part of you feels that you shouldn't be feeling that. You should just be enjoying the relationship and appreciating it. And uh, who, who are you to kind of have those feelings? Roger's theory of development is based on the idea that as we grow up, we develop conditions of worth, which is about feeling that some of our experiences aren't okay to feel. It's not so much about behaviors it's not like kind of we we learn that you know we shouldn't kill people or something of course we shouldn't kill people but it's more that what we learn is that some experiences like disappointment i think with martha hurt it's not okay to feel that and rogers comes from that position that those things are kind of healthy they're intelligible they make sense they can help guide us they're like a compass so it's kind of like not looking at our own inner compass we we lose connection with that um you know, Martha's disappointed, she's hurt because um, there was something that she wanted there in that relationship that was really important to her. Um, and the work is about helping her at this point is about helping her connect with that, feel that that's okay, feel understood and, uh, and, and in relation to someone else with that. So she's not alone with those feelings. And also to think about what she can maybe learn from it. Yeah. But you do have them, don't you? Yeah. So you can see there that I'm trying to validate those feelings. Um, you know, to say those feelings are there and that's okay. That that's that is how you feel. Yeah, it just feels like I don't know, like as I've said, like having a younger brother and like I don't know. Like I'm the one that's always taking care of other people. Um, and like, then, then on some level, I felt like I had to then take care of Josh being like, Oh no, it's okay that you can't come. Like, Oh, don't feel sorry. Like I accept your apology, but like, Oh really? It's okay. Mm. Uh, do you, something comes up to me. I mean, do you feel that he looks after you? Uh, that's a kind of stupid quiz. That's a bit left field. Um, I think where I was coming with that was thinking that there's a sense in which I think I felt that she maybe wanted some looking after, but I think I'm way kind of on a different track there. And, um, you know, just listening to that, I think I could have stayed much more with her experience there. I mean, she was talking about, for instance, a brother, she's making some connections with her own past about the way that as, as an older sister, um, she'd, had to be the one who's kind of stronger and knew what was going on and did things and that um and as i was saying before it wasn't okay maybe for her to have those more um disappointed feelings and and and, and feel hurt um that wasn't her role in the family i could have stayed with that really uh rather than leaping on to the question about whether she felt looked after by josh or not i think I mean, I think so. Like he, he's generous. Um, 
I mean, like I've said before, like he only really says I love you like after I say it. Um, but I think what comes up for me, and you know, this might be completely wrong, um, and just tell me if it is, but I, it does feel like at some level there's a sense of maybe when he's ghosting you or when he's kind of dropping out of stuff, but <clears throat> it feels like he's not, I mean, looking after is not the right word, but something about how he's not there for you, he's not reliable, he's not dependable. You know, you talked a bit last time about your brother and that role that you had in the family and kind of wanting, you were saying, one of the things you said last week was about always wanting a bigger brother who, you know, somebody who, who, who you wouldn't have to do all the looking after. And I just wonder if that connects at all to what's going on with Josh in terms of wanting him to be that person, maybe feeling a bit disappointed that he's not. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm just listening to that thing. Shut up, Mick. <laughs> Shut up. That is enough already. Um, yeah, you can clearly see my kind of understanding coming through about her feeling disappointed by Josh and... <laughs> And, and what I'm missing there, I guess, is being able to go back more to her experience and the, the hurt that she's talked about. I really haven't come back to. Um, and yeah, her feeling of maybe um, that it's difficult for her to talk about that disappointment or hurt. But I'm kind of the more I'm talking, the more it's getting kind of conceptual and the more I'm kind of losing her and the more it's an expression of my own kind of theories and understanding, which which isn't, I think, particularly massively helpful. I mean, I think like, like part of me just wants to be in a relationship where, I don't know, like we can look after each other or um, like someone who's aware of my feelings or impact or, you know, like comes home after a long day and if I'm feeling down, like it's able yeah i don't know if take take care of the right word but like just like tune in at least one thing i do there is i really give her the chance to say that i'm wrong and i think that's really important it's so easy with when you say to clients something like it sounds like this or it sounds like that that clients because of that power differential will feel that they have to agree with us so sometimes saying like this might be really wrong or you know really feel that you can disagree with that i think is a useful thing to say to clients to allow them to say things in their own words and what, what's really meaningful for them tune into that hmm. um someone who's maybe tuned into you and knows what your feelings are and it sounds like you're saying with josh and for instance with the wedding there was a real sense of him not understanding what the impact of what what, what he did was yeah yeah but I'm like, we've also been together a year, so I don't want to just like discount like all that he does do for me and like, you know, the good times that we have together. But I don't know. We've also been together a year. Like, I'm ready. <laughs> um, You're ready for? Um, if you don't understand what a client is saying, like somebody says, I'm ready. Like, I don't know what she means she's ready for. It's fine to say, ready for what? Or can you just say a bit more about that? Um, just, you, you want to understand what, what, what it is a client's talking about. And it's really fine to ask. Like, to feel in a committed, like, long-term relationship. I mean, that doesn't need to be marriage, but like, especially going to the wedding. Um, like I want kids, um, just like being in a relationship where like, it feels like it's full of like full of love and full of taking care of each other and checking in and like also independence, but like maybe it's okay to be a little dependent on each other in terms of checking in, um, do you feel that you can be dependent on Josh? Oh God, I go back to that again. <laughs> but I think you can hear, um, you know, something stronger is coming through. And I think what we are hearing, despite <laughs> despite my interventions rather than as well as, um, is, is that Martha is talking about something that's important for her about what kind of relationship she wants, that she wants someone where there can be some dependence and 
Um, and I guess that is that, you know, that kind of organismic valuing um, that, 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 uh, of kind of recognizing, going back to, you know, what kind of, where is she? What is important to her? And that's what can be helpful in this work is, is helping a client to kind of clarify things that maybe they haven't clarified for themselves before, really understood for themselves about where they're at in life and what they want. Um, like, I feel like I am at times, but then I always have to be aware that like he might flake out. I, I imagine that makes it quite hard to let yourself go and really allow yourself to be dependent on him. Yeah. That's yeah, what... it's like, it just always has to be like an awareness, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess what comes through to me is just that sense of you feeling like you have to kind of hold yourself back a bit and not <clears throat> totally allow yourself to trust him because although there's some really positive things that you really love about him, you really like about him, at some level because of the flakiness because sudden things it's like you just can't let yourself sink down into the relationship and really trust it i think despite yeah despite me kind of following my own agenda i think i am picking up on something quite deep there as well and i do do you have that sense that i'm listening and again at a kind of embodied level which is important of just that anxiety of like i do have a sense of her wanting to sink into the relationship and wanting to be held and wanting to trust and that actually this kind of flakiness i mean ghosting like you know when she talks about him not being in touch for a couple of days like i kind of physically feel that as i'm listening it's just like bloody hell that must be awful um and just that rockiness like being on a kind of roller coaster with someone um and just not being able to trust kind of attachment if you think i guess maybe is some of what i'm feeling there um, and the insecurity that, that is there in that relationship with Josh. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know, but like then when things are good, things feel really good. Um, but I guess just like more and more that awareness of like, well, things might might drop out again. Um, but then also knowing that like his flakiness or ghosting or whatever only ever lasts a few days. So like, it'll be back, but yeah, and no, it feels like a roller coaster and it's exhausting. Sorry. It feels like a really like a roller coaster. Like it's a roller exhausting. coaster and it's exhausting. Yeah. Say so more about that exhausting in what way? Um, just like riding that wave of, of like, things are really good. And then like being taken out of it and then going into doubt and going into like, oh my God, are all men like this? Like, I think I just spiral about like, will I ever find someone? Or like, if he is the one, then how do I deal with this? Um, and then that'll just be for a few days. And then it's like back to being great and you know, we get along so well and just like riding that and always keeping it in the back of my head of like how much I love him. I don't know. It's... Mm, I can really hear that roller coaster. I can really hear those kind of highs of feeling like you love him and feeling things are great and everything's okay. But then it kind of dips down and you get these <clears throat> times when it feels like you, you feel let down and feel not understood and feel um, like he's not really there for you and then it gets okay again so it kind of leaves you not really certain what to do whether this is a relationship you can trust is it one that you can kind of really commit to so it's interesting listening to this because actually one of the things is that a few years ago i did have quite a similar relationship myself that was a real roller coaster um kind of just those ups and downs and just feeling like it was really exhausting um I mean, I don't share that with her and I don't think it would have been helpful to share that. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's not what she wants to hear or particularly wants to talk about. But I think I kind of am drawing on that, you know, with those experiences, you have to be careful that you don't, um, <clears throat> even if you don't talk about it, that you don't assume that the client's experience is going to be the same as yours. But Dave Mears talks about kind of existential touchstones. It's like if you have had experiences 
sometimes that can help you enter more into the client's world and to understand that at that kind of emotional level of what it m might be like but might is the key word there rather than is like yeah but i also feel like i don't know like i love him so much that like to think about not being with him is just I don't know. Like, can I just put up with, I don't know. Can you just put up with? With like him flaking out or whatever. Um, Cause then things go back to being really good. Um, but also, I don't know. Like, I don't want that to be my whole life. Yeah. The thought of a whole life of being with someone who's constantly flaking out or you, you can't trust that they're not going to flake out at some point. Yeah. Or like if we have kids together and then he does that, like, I don't want, I don't want our kids all of a sudden thinking that's normal or like that would be a lot on me to have to take care of kids like while he's gone or whatever. So what's your sense of, what's your sense of what's going on? It sounds like the key, you know, there's this key, like there's a really good relationship but then there's these periods where things really don't work for you because Josh is, is what you describe as kind of flaking out or ghosting you or disappearing. So I guess there's a question of whether that can change um, or whether it's something you need to accept. If you need to accept it, it sounds like, you know, you're really not sure if this is the right relationship, but, you know, maybe it's something that can change. What what happened? I mean, how, how do you, when he does ghost that, when these things go you know wrong how do you kind of respond to that how how do you engage with that I'm, that's just awful um i've said about five different things there um yeah and far too much god um i you know i think that from a person's end of standpoint where we've got to is this kind of tension in the client this dilemma between about wanting to be in this relationship not wanting to be in it will have concerns and I could have just stayed with that really and um, I don't know was I a bit anxious in the silence maybe or feeling like I needed to do something certainly I try and kind of start asking about what's going on like we're going to start talking about Josh and then I go back and ask about how she's feeling I mean it's, it's, it's a very messy uh, thing to say I think it would have been much better just to stay and trust the client that if we stayed with that 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 that, that dilemma um that the client might find a way forward and it's not that i guess where i come from would be not sometimes clients do need some help with that but we've just kind of got to that point and certainly at this point i think i could have stayed with it more um i mean like usually i call carla but she's married now <laughs> um <laughs> i don't know like I mean, the first few times I was definitely more shocked and now it's now it feels like taking care of a little kid. Like, I'm just going to wait. Um, oh, you know, when she says that taking care of a little kid, they're like what what happens to me is that is I guess I'm saying that is not a relationship. That is that is, you know, you don't want to. I mean, I am engaged and, and, and you know, that sense of really. I don't want to have a relationship for the rest of my life with someone who's going to be a little kid. It's like that. That sounds pretty horrific at that point, and I can feel that emotionally. I'm not sure I say it, but I can certainly feel it. Um, and it's like something that's annoying and definitely, definitely, like upsetting. But I don't know. I like. I know he'll be back, um, or hope he will. Um, how, how do you respond to him? Do you talk to him about it? Do you? Yeah. Um, I mean, I send a lot of texts. Um, I try calling. But like, I don't know, when he comes back and apologizes, it's, it's always something like, you know, oh, he wasn't around his phone or his phone died or um, like could be true. I don't know if it is. Um, you can charge a phone. Um, I don't know. He apologizes, and then it's good to be with him. I mean, I think I tell him, like, don't do that. Okay, so you say don't do that, but do you, do you tell him how you feel, like what goes on for you and what it's like for you? 
Um, not really. I guess where I'm coming from here a bit is that there is something helpful about being congruent and transparent with others about how we feel some of the time at least. Uh, and that sometimes problems there, interpersonal problems are there because we don't talk to others about how we feel or, or share how we feel. And I guess I see that as a bit of a point of therapeutic leverage, leverage being kind of places in therapy where you think, well, maybe something could change here. Um, I guess when I'm working with clients, I am thinking about, you know, where can, where could change happen? Like, you know, certainly leverage is not around her feelings. Maybe somebody would say that, but I get a sense that her feelings of disappointment and uh, kind of concerns about the relationship. I, I wouldn't see that as a point of therapeutic leverage because I think that really makes sense to me. And also, you know, her love for Josh makes sense for me. For me. So I guess in thinking about what might improve in this situation, I'm thinking, well, maybe there's something around if she could talk with him about it. Um, <clears throat> maybe express it more, maybe have more of that conversation, maybe help him understand it more. So that's kind of leading in a way, but it's also based around maybe a kind of relational person-centered understanding that we do exist in this relational nexus. And congruence isn't just about something inside of us. It's also something about our relationships with others being congruent and transparent. And if we can have that, then better things tend to happen. So I guess that's where I'm going with it. Because I can hear for you, like what you described with the wedding that you feel hurt and maybe disappointed. You feel kind of like maybe, you know, let down in some ways perhaps. So that's all going on for you. But it sounds like you don't share that. What you say is, you know, you got to do this and you, you got to be in touch like you said last week. But um you, you, what happens that you don't tell him how you feel? Um, I don't know. Like, we don't really talk about feelings that much. I don't know. I feel like women are better about that. Like, Carla and I will just, like, talk about feelings for hours. <laughs> um, But... I don't know. I mean, I could with Josh, but I don't know. Like, sometimes he's just like, not that he brushes it off, but it's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, like he'll say, I love you when I say, I love you first. Like he has to follow my lead on everything. And then it's, it's, I don't know. Like, if I start bringing up emotions, either he's going to, I don't know. Like, maybe he would just laugh it off or turn it into a joke. Like, not in a bad way. He's funny. Um, I don't know. It just does uh, it's not the norm. It's not the norm. I wonder, you know, to if you thought about saying to him, look, Josh, you know, I felt really hurt. Um... You know, I, I really wanted you to be there, like stuff that you said to me, or imagine stuff you said to Carla about what, how it really impacts you. I, I, when you think about, like, imagine saying that to Josh, um, what does it bring up for you? Um, like, all of a sudden, I'm dependent. Um... Yeah, I think it. So, you know, on the one hand, you could say this is really me following my agenda about her talking, you know, maybe maybe there's some judgment there that she should be talking it through. I don't think I'm saying she should be, but I guess I'm exploring whether that might be helpful. And I guess I am coming from the place of thinking that that is, as I said before, potentially a place of useful therapeutic leverage that maybe that would be good. And, and that kind of bleeds into things like interpersonal therapy perspectives, for instance, which would hold that um, talking openly and honestly with people is not always, but, but, but can be a good thing. It's certainly all nonviolent communication about expressing our needs and expressing our wants. There's a lot of different theories about the value of uh, talking kind of honestly. Um, and it is also interesting. I mean, she touches now on dependency, which is again, it feels like quite a deep, 
you know, that fear of dependency, that, that feels like quite a deep feeling that, that, that we're now getting into and connecting with about what it would mean to really talk to him. She kind of laughs it off and she kind of says, oh, men can't do that. And I kind of don't go with that. Maybe I feel slightly, um, maybe I'm slightly an, not annoyed, but I just, I think there's part of me at this point thinking that she does have some responsibility and she's kind of very much putting out, oh, Josh can do that. And I'm thinking, well, Maybe there is also something about you bringing in yourself into that relationship and that you have some responsibilities there as well. And, you know, I don't say it in that way to her. I think it'd be difficult to say that in a way that wasn't experienced as critical. Um, but I, at the same time, I'm not just going with, you know, it wouldn't be okay for Josh. I'm kind of bringing her back to herself and her possibilities for saying that. Yeah, I think it would feel weird to be like, not yeah like to all of a sudden say what I not like what I need but I don't know like growing up I people were always the one coming to me with that kind of stuff or um like I was taking care of my brother and I don't know like saying that saying that to Josh either either would feel like I'm being like the teacher being like it's time to talk about feelings um and like because he is childish in some ways um or all of a sudden me coming to him being like this needy needy little girlfriend it's kind of needy little girlfriend and the thought of you as a needy little girlfriend is what really uncomfortable or unfamiliar. I guess in Rajirian terms, that, that sense of neediness is, is part of her experiencing that has been denied and distorted. She, it's not okay for her to, she's grown up feeling that it's not okay to her to feel needy and to want someone, but actually those feelings are there and that they're legitimate and the work is, kind of bringing those to the surface in a sense and talking about them and allowing her to feel that they're okay because through that empathy through that unconditional acceptance what we're communicating is that that neediness is is is, is legitimate it's we do need other people she does need she does need Josh. i mean that's the reality that she does need josh and she's disappointed because he's just disappearing um that's the truth of it that's the truth of it that we're kind of coming to. Uh, like cringy. Cringy. <laughs> yeah. Cringy to, to for you to have feelings and needs. Um. Yeah, I mean that's normal, but I guess to like be needy. <laughs> like I don't know. It feels like there's a difference between having needs and then yeah. being needy. So you don't want to be needy. Yeah. But you do have needs. Yeah. You, it sounds like, you know, some of the needs you talked about with Josh is about feeling like he's kind of there for you, feeling like he, he's not going to just disappear. Those yeah. are some of your needs. But it sounds like it's quite difficult to imagine kind of sharing that because perhaps it touches on your own feelings of, vulnerability yeah yeah I don't know it feels like things I'm fine talking about like with Carla like with other people who talk about that kind of stuff um but that's just like not his personality I don't know yeah or maybe he does with the other guys I don't know but I'm just aware that you're kind of I guess describing it or explaining it in terms of Josh and what Josh is like and Josh is a bit, bit childish and, you know, I guess Josh isn't in the room. So, you know, can't, it's difficult to discuss that, but I guess for you, what you're kind of recognizing, you know, if we just keep it focused on you is that for you, maybe sharing that and being open about that vulnerability is difficult. You're kind of used to being in that role of looking after other people, aren't you? yeah it's kind of it's quite challenging that i mean 
<clears throat> sees a game, putting it onto Josh, and I'm kind of, there's a bit of a tussle, I guess, going on. I'm kind of putting it back to her. Uh, and I don't know where vulnerability came in. I mean, I think that was really from me. She doesn't talk about vulnerability. Um, I guess I kind of pick up on that. Um, yeah, I'm inviting her to go back to herself and to think about what it might be like, you know, for her to share those feelings with Josh and for her maybe to express some neediness towards Josh. Um, I imagine with Carla, maybe that's unfair. I imagine with Carla, it's probably a lot about criticizing Josh rather than perhaps her saying to Carla, I need him. I want him. I feel scared. He's going to let me down. Maybe she says that, maybe that's unfair. Um, but I'm kind of, but the fact that it evokes quite a lot of feeling in her kind of cringiness and uncomfortableness to me, says something about how that is difficult for her and is maybe something where there are conditions of worth around it. Yeah. Yeah, it feels weird to then like reverse that. I wonder if there's part of you that in some ways in relationships, because you talked about a few past relationships before and you were saying that there was kind of, you know, a bit similar patterns. I wonder if, you know, part of you does tend to go into relationships and maybe not create that situation, but just because it feels so familiar, there's something about getting back into that role of being the one who's maybe kind of looking after the other person and being the dependent one. And maybe it's less familiar or more difficult to go into that role of being the one who also has needs. And Yeah. I mean, like, I like being the one who takes care of people and like, I don't know, that brings me warmth and yeah, maybe it just feels familiar or something I know that I'm good at. Um, and then to all of a sudden need that from someone else feels like, well, why can't I do it for myself? Or um, That you should be able to do that for yourself. Yeah. There's a uh... There's a lovely phrase from the Gestalt therapist, Richard Heisner, who talks about the deep soul nourishment that only others can bring. Um, the deep soul nourishment that only others can bring. And as I'm listening to that, I'm thinking about the work around relational depth, which is based in more of a kind of interrelational <coughs> frame, rather than perhaps more classical client-centered therapy, which is a bit more individual-centered. Uh, but from the work we've done in relational depth, that is the idea that we really need that connection with other people we need other people um and that she's kind of saying i should be able to provide that for myself and i guess my assumption is i'm sure there's a lot that she can provide for herself um but i guess i'm also thinking that yeah there is things that we need from other people there is things that she needs from josh uh, it's kind of i think i feel it's kind of sadness her saying that there's there's something kind of quite isolated about this idea that <clears throat> You know, I, I, I need to provide myself with all these uh, kind of affection and warmth and meeting my needs that I can't expect others to um, provide that with me, for me. Yeah, like if I can do it for other people, I don't know. But then why can't I have it from someone else? I don't know. Yeah, why, why can't someone else do that for you? Um, I don't know, like maybe I'm like scared is the wrong word but like if I all of a sudden experience that then how sad would it be to realize that I went like 26 years without that that's quite a powerful statement isn't it um you know so I have to recognize that I've gone 26 years without this um yeah that really strikes me she's saying that so that really touched on some painful feelings, some sad feelings. Yeah. To think about that you've actually, what, not had that, that you've always looked after others, but actually for a lot of your life, maybe all your life, that you haven't felt looked after yourself. Yeah. I mean, like in different ways I have, but. But yeah, I don't feel like I really have in like 
the way that I look after other people. Um, you haven't been looked after in the way that you look after other people. Yeah. Because you had to do so much of the looking after, I guess, when you were younger. Because of with your brother. Yeah, and just like in all like past relationships and things like that. Like even friendships a little bit too. Like I feel like I'm the one that's like hyper aware of other people and their needs and like their feelings and things that are important to them. Um, yeah, and like I haven't really had that. And so not that it's like better than to go my whole life without feeling it, but I don't know, like if I feel it now, like I don't want to feel like then I was missing out my whole life. I hear there's some real sadness as you say that. I could hear that a kind of voice was almost cracking there. And you can just feel how much the kind of pace has slowed down. It was like a very kind of deep level of connection now. Just thought we were missing out your whole life. And all I'm offering is just very, very simple reflections at this point. Really, nothing more needs to be said. How you how are you feeling as you say that? Mm. I guess sad. Uh, um, I don't know, but then I think like my default is to think of like, well, people do nice things. Um, like maybe like negating that feeling. Um. People do nice things, just does nice things for you. Yeah, yeah. That's, that sounds really true, but it also sounds like that there is that sadness as well, under, maybe underneath it or alongside it. Yeah. Feeling like you've always been looking after other people. Yeah. And to ask for it now, to express that need for other people now, would be to kind of recognise that maybe you haven't had it as much as you'd like to yeah like if i do it now then like why didn't i 10 years ago like i don't know i've gotten this far <laughs> yeah and you've done amazing i mean you know the things you described in your life relationships you've done amazingly well but it does also feel like maybe something has been missing and i guess there's a question maybe a choice about whether do you kind of recognize that and try and do something to maybe bring that more into your life or do you say well you know i've been okay up to now and um i'm, I'm just gonna let it go yeah so it's kind of clarifying the kind of different pools the different directions um that's going on for her it's interesting though i say well you've done amazingly well i'm not sure if that's i mean is that helpful um the reality is actually that in relationships she has struggled, but I guess I'm trying to hold that positive um, and maybe to, um, yeah, yeah, I guess I'm really conscious of not wanting to come across as critical, wanting to come across as prizing and really valuing and respecting her uh, and not to be saying, well, now you need to acknowledge this. I guess if I'm honest, you know, part of me does feel that she's better off kind of recognizing that now and maybe beginning to feel that she can be a bit dependent and allowing that side of her to grow rather than spending the rest of her life kind of saying, well, I don't want to do this because it means recognizing it. And then when she's 50 or 60, still feeling, well, I've never done it. You know, it kind of doesn't, doesn't feel quite the right way to go, but I want to honor and hold both of those different standpoints. Yeah. Cause I get a sense with Josh, when you, you know, that there's lots of great things there and that you really love him and that you have a lot, but there is something, you know, there is something more that you want, need from him. Yeah. Yeah. Like equipoise is a nice word, equipoise. Um, I think it comes from doing randomized controlled trials, but equipoise, just holding that balance, being able to put both, uh, both sides of it.
and put it back to the client so that the client can think about where they want to go with that. Yeah, or like all of a sudden I'm realizing like if we are going to be like life partners or like make that commitment, then yeah, there are things that I would want from him more so than if we were just like casually dating. Mm. And what are those things? Um, like, yeah, I guess that I can depend on him, like some level of consistency, um, some initiation from him. Um, yeah. I guess like dependability. Yeah. 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 So you, so you, there are some needs there, aren't there? Yeah. And I imagine it feels, I imagine it doesn't feel easy to kind of say these are things that I need from him. Yeah. No. Then I, yeah, I feel like then I just be, in my head, I become like, a needy girlfriend that he'll want to, I don't know, like, that's not convenient. <laughs> that, that what, that, that's not, that he'll want to what, that he'll want to get rid of? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, like, if he realizes all of a sudden that, like, he has to step up to the plate more, um, or, like, yeah, that I want to be able to depend on him, that, like, more is being asked of him, that'll be the tipping point. So you're worried that if you express those needs, he'll go. Yeah. Yeah. Which, like, of course, I don't want to break up with him, but. Yeah. Yeah. Or that he'll, like, lash out, like, you know, make it a joke or not take it seriously. Um, and then I'll, like, I don't want to always be the one that's like, you are really funny, but we have to have a serious conversation. Like, I want to be fun. Yeah. So I guess that's another need. You want to be the fun one, but yeah. you know, as you say, you don't want to always be the one looking after him. Yeah. But it feels difficult. It's like you've got needs, but it feels difficult and it's almost like you don't feel you have a right to express them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's like that I don't have the right, but yeah, maybe it's that, or... Maybe that's not quite right. Like, weighing, things are so good, so why, why like, mess with that? There's a fear of messing with it if you express your needs. And I guess it feels really unfamiliar, doesn't it? To, yeah. To be able to express your needs, but like you're saying, like, with David at work as well, it's in those situations, you feel kind of powerless, don't you, that you just have to go along with that yeah yeah i mean the nice thing about like at work is i have a boss <laughs> whereas you don't <laughs> like have a boss, Josh, in your there is no boss. <laughs> there's no boss so there's no boss so in a sense there's you that it comes down to you doesn't it yeah because i guess i just wonder you know you want you know the idea would be just different in some ways I know not in in lots of ways you'd love him as he is but there are ways that you'd like him to be different and maybe he's not going to change without you kind of well not that you can make him change but maybe you can talk to him about how you feel what it does to you uh, how upset you get um so that he understands that more I guess that does feel very leading um I kind of made, you know, you can really hear me kind of banging on about maybe she could talk to him and tell him what she feels. Um, yeah, I, it, <laughs> this feels too much. I guess, you know, nobody, none of us are mind readers and, you know, Josh may not know that without some conversation. Yeah, I mean, I feel like he knows it in some way, like, intuitively like you know me getting upset or whatever when he goes or like when he couldn't come to the wedding um but yeah like I haven't told him directly like this is what I need from you but 
I don't know. Like I can tell when he's upset and like when he needs space and when he needs comfort or mm. things like that. Like I'd love for him to be able to sense it. <laughs> yeah, you want him to be able to pick it up and just be able to know what you're feeling. Yeah. But mm, well, maybe maybe he does. It sounds like maybe he doesn't. Yeah. You kind of hope he does, and you think intuitively he has some sense, but maybe, you know, I guess there's a possibility that he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't know how much it upsets you. Maybe there's a way, maybe what we need to be thinking about is ways that you can maybe communicate that to him in a way that doesn't feel needy, but does also allow you to have kind of needs and to feel that it's okay to express those needs. I have no idea where that is going. I mean, I think the point is maybe that it's okay to her to feel needy. Um, so to say she can express it in a way that doesn't feel needy is <laughs> just, you know, I think that is really bringing back a kind of judgment into it, which is really not helpful. I mean, I think of where I'm at at this point is, is this is less person centered and is more, um, and some of the stuff I've kind of written about, been interested in from interpersonal therapy, existential therapy, about how we kind of assume that people can read us and they can't always, and that sometimes we need to be really explicit about what's going on for ourselves inside because um, we often assume people know what's going on. Actually, they don't. The kind of myth of the myth of the kind of what is it? The myth of the transparent mind, um, which is interesting, and which I do agree with. But um, yeah, it's not particularly person centered. It's very much my theory is coming in here, uh, and and in a in a kind of jumbled and fairly inconsistent way. I'm just Martha. I'm just aware of the time. We just got a couple of minutes before we need to finish. Okay. How's it felt talking today? Um. I don't know. Um, like, I think it's all stuff that, like, I know deep down. Um, and so, like, part of it is hard to then talk about um, or realize or whatever. Um, What's the stuff you know deep down? Like, that I want more. Um, that him not coming to the wedding, like, actually really sucked. Um, even though, you know, like, I accepted his apology so quickly. Um. I think that kind of says to me that it has been a useful session. Um, you know, that it, it's kind of brought to the surface stuff that she's known deep down. And by kind of saying it's been difficult to, you know, stuff that's difficult to acknowledge, but she has acknowledged it and she has talked about it and she has kind of felt, I think, at some level, the, the kind of the suck, suck, suckiness, the suckness of it, that, um, that it is difficult and hurtful for her. Maybe it helped to think about um how she feels more in a relationship with josh what she wants you can see this kind of leading on to more conversations really about the relationship and her thinking about it and i guess you know on the one hand i feel like talking to him about it and the way i've been kind of pushing that in the last part of this session is is quite directive um but on the other hand, if I'm honest, it does feel like also a place of real therapeutic leverage. Like it would be a shame for her to kind of, you know, at the moment she's seeing itself as kind of like two options. Either she stays with Josh or she leaves Josh. But if there is this option that she could talk to him about it and if it meant that he would understand more and he could be more sensitive and responsive, I mean, it might not be. But, you know, if that is a possibility, that does seem like, a good potential way forward. So even if maybe it is a bit directive and a bit less person centered, um, I think I, I think potentially that there, 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 there is value in that. Um, yeah, potentially. And I guess you can say it's person centered in the sense of congruent, it's me bringing in um, kind of my feelings about it, but it is also kind of bringing in more theory from, from different other areas to, kind of bring in something to suggest essentially to Martha. Yeah, like that it affects me. Um, so to acknowledge those things and kind of have it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I feel like, I don't know, like there is no time in a day. Like I work, I'm tired. Then I, then we're hanging out and things are good. Like there's no real time to check in besides with you. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it feels, I don't know. Now I have a lot to think about. Well, that's a good sign. It's kind of brought stuff to the surface, I guess, hasn't that? Like yeah. you say, kind of like stuff, you know, deep inside about maybe your needs and what's not working for you as well as what is. Yeah. And I guess things are so busy, it's kind of easy to kind of bury that. But I guess the reason you came here to counselling is because you did want to think it through and yeah. kind of process it. But I appreciate that that's not always easy. Yeah. Like, I wish I could do this, like with Josh, you know, like, let's set up one hour. Let's talk. <laughs> um, you yeah. like that time to talk about this stuff with Josh and Yeah. I mean actually I, I don't work with couples, I'm not experienced as a couple of therapy, but actually that suggests that maybe encouraging them to talk with someone together about it um might be really helpful. Uh maybe having somebody there would allow her to express more of this, maybe that would help. If Josh was making a joke about it, that would help to kind of stay with it. And also, of course, hearing from Josh what he's experiencing um, and how he's perceiving it all. So, you know, that, that could have been something maybe later in this work to suggest and raise. And, you know, if you are experienced couples therapy, to bring that in um, as an option or to offer that um, or to offer, suggest that that's something she might pick up with someone else. They might pick yeah. up. It sounds like you've maybe done some of that, but I guess what you're saying is that some of that hasn't maybe been directly expressed to him. Yeah. I mean, like a little bit, but I feel like it's like while we're cooking dinner or like, I don't know, we're always doing, or like in the car, like it's not just like actually sitting down without distraction. Um, yeah. yeah or it's so fast yeah. you know and then he's funny <laughs> and yeah. then we joke and i don't know and it sounds like these kind of things with josh about his use of humor that maybe makes it more difficult to have that serious conversations but i think what we've been talking about in this session is also there's maybe things in you that make it difficult as well at times to be open about what's going on for you and how things affect you that you kind of naturally go into that kind of role of looking after someone else maybe rather than allowing somebody to look after you or feeling that it's okay for you to be looked after and expressing those feelings okay so that, that's kind of challenging again i'm i'm kind of putting that back to her and um yeah i'm kind of saying there's you've got a part in it is, is that helpful you know i guess the risk with something like that is it always comes across as critical but also I want my clients to to have some learning. And I, I guess if Martha came out of the session just with thinking, well, Josh is flaky and he just makes a joke of everything. I'm not sure how helpful that would be. I, I think as a counselor, as Martha's counselor, I have some role to help her learn something about herself here. And maybe something that is, is not the easiest thing to accept, but maybe something that's important to, to recognise yeah like it feels weird to all of a sudden bring up my needs like when he is tired from a long day or like when he's stressed when i don't know it's much easier for me to be like i'll cook dinner or like you relax or let's talk things through or like oh i bought you something um that's just yeah it feels like less effort on my part yeah easier but there's also i guess something about the kind of psychological effort about yeah doing something you know the situation and things there's things about josh but there's also things about you and i guess what you were saying earlier in the session is that in some ways you got a i don't know like a choice or do you kind of try and find ways of being in a relationship in which you also have needs and those are expressed or is it just too difficult to go that way and do you you know, is it better to just stay in that kind of role of looking after? I don't know what you, what do you think. Do you... I mean, <laughs> with, with like thirty seconds to go, asking a client, "What do you think about a massive question like that?" Is not a brilliant thing to say. 
um yeah really not helpful um i feel like it'll like i could totally be the caretaker or whatever for like i don't know 20 more years but then all of a sudden it'll hit me that like wow i'm 50 and i'm taking care of everyone I don't know, like, like the candle will burn out and at some point it'll be too late to now find someone <laughs> who can take care of me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I should probably do that now. Sorry? So I should probably do that now. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm aware, you know, when you, when you were talking about that and that choice, I was saying, you could definitely do that role, couldn't you, doing, being that caretaker? And I can see why it would be sad to kind of acknowledge that there might be differences. But I guess if I'm, if I'm honest, you know, there's part of me was thinking, but yeah, it would be sad, but also do you want to, is it better, would it be better to do that now than get to your 50s or your 60s and then, you know, think, because, yeah, you're still so young and there's still so much possibility. So I guess what's good there is I think that I'm honest about it and I own it. Um, maybe I should have done that a bit earlier. And I say, you know, that, 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 that's that kind of congruence of saying um, what my, how I, how I see it. And what the value of that in a sense is it allows the client to stand back more and rather than a kind of implicit message, there's a kind of, it's explicitly stated and the client might say, well, actually, you know, I want to, um, I want to live like this and, and I'm happy with it and I'm making that decision, but at least in a sense, they're making that decision uh, and they're reflecting on it um, and they're, they're choosing it rather than it just kind of automatically happening. Yeah. But also like, I don't know, friends are getting married. Like it doesn't feel like there's that much time. Yeah. I don't know what she means by that. Does that, that feels a pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, especially like wanting kids and, um, like wanting to really like start a family, like. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's a kind of balance there, isn't there between kind of wanting to get on with it and the finding the right person and finding yeah. who you can be in, in, in that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I understand at that point she's saying like I, I need to get on with this and maybe it's not going to be perfect. Maybe, you know, if I start expressing my needs and then that pushes Josh away and then, you know, then we're not going to get onto the baby. So, you know, we get to the end of the session really and there's there's these two poles, these two different things. But I think we've clarified, we've deepened, we've understood more about where they're coming from and as Martha's saying there's a lot for her to take away and kind of process and digest. Yeah, okay, if we finish there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll see you next week then. Okay. Thank you. So I hope that's interesting. Um, you know, it's by no means a perfect session and I can you know, there's some things I see myself doing now. I think, oh my God, how could I do that? Um but I think overall, what I get a sense of is a process of deepening. Um, I like watching that, that things do really slow down and that there is more kind of emotional depth and more relational depth between us in terms of that understanding. I think there's a lot of questions at the end of it and certainly we don't come to any easy answers. But I think there's kind of more in the mix there for Martha, more thinking about maybe more understanding of, of herself in those relationships um and if you see that session in the context of some sessions before beginning to talk about that and then more sessions coming back <clears throat> next week maybe to talk more and, and more of what's happening maybe that there is more conversation that she'll then have with Josh I kind of think probably it's it, it, there's some helpful work going on there in terms of developing Martha's insight helping her connect more with herself and understand herself more I mean of course what would be great would be to understand more from Martha about how she found that session and uh, what it was like for her and whether there were things there that she felt that she could take away. 
um you know and in another video maybe that that would be a good thing to to do is is to hear a lot more from the client but i hope that gives some sense of the kind of a person-centered process and how it can bring things out and 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 be um have a kind of therapeutic uh potential so thanks for listening Thank you.